This episode of Messed Up Origins was brought to you by Skillshare. What's up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and this is Messed Up Origins, the show where I break down the disturbing source material that inspired your favorite childhood stories. Or in the case of Coraline, the equally disturbing source material, because I think after last week's episode, we can all agree that both the book and movie are twisted in their own special ways. Now, last time I did a summary of the movie, followed by a breakdown of the first six chapters of the book. So today I'll be covering the remaining seven chapters, as well as some of the real life details that author Neil Gaiman has cited as inspiration. I'm excited to say there is a lot of juicy info in this episode that's going to make your next time viewing the movie even better, so make sure you stay tuned throughout the whole thing. Before we start up though, I do want to thank our old friends at Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Listen, at this point we all know who Skillshare is. They're a service that offers a huge variety of classes on skills you've always wanted to have, but never knew where you could learn about them. For just $10 a month, you get access to over 25,000 classes in fields like film editing, photography, creative writing, and many more. Say you want to write a story that's creepy as f like Coraline is. Skillshare can help you with that. And if you want to convert your work into a screenplay and make a short film out of it, they can help you with that too. They're basically the perfect site for anyone who wants to feed their creativity, curiosity, or even take their first steps down a new career path. I've personally used them in the past to learn some new film editing and graphic design techniques, but now that I'm finally settled in my new place with total control over my schedule, you can bet that I'll be moving on to some of the more advanced classes soon. If you want to join me on my journey of self-betterment, just go through my link in the description to get yourself a two-month free trial. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to open up that door and venture to the other world. Before we do, though, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to have more content like this delivered to your sub box every week, and most importantly, enjoy. So I want to start this episode off by addressing a glaring error I made in part one, where for some reason I referred to the other mother as the Bedlam instead of her actual name, the Beldum. Oh. It took approximately four seconds for someone to comment a correction, but at that point it was too late for me to do anything about it. The video was already uploaded and I spent the entire last third of it referring to her as the Bedlam and I just wasn't going to refilm all that. I'm not exactly sure how I didn't realize my mistake, being that I've read the book twice now and seen the movie twice as many times in the past week, but I do want to thank those who not only corrected me, but did so politely. To me, you're more than solo cups. You're solo goblets. Now if you're curious about what a beldam is, as opposed to a bedlam, I've got the answer for you. It means a malicious and ugly woman, usually an old one, or a witch. And while the Coraline version of the beldam is a completely original creation by Neil Gaiman, there is a bit of lore behind the creature that some believe may have inspired him. I don't actually want to get into all that until we break down the rest of the book, so that way we can make as many connections as possible but again, stay until the end of this video and you'll be happy you did. So when we left off, Coraline had just pissed off the Beldum, who responded by locking her in a broom closet sized room behind a mirror. Coraline tried feeling her way around the tiny room she was trapped in to assess her surroundings, and in the process she discovered the ghosts of three children who were also stuck there. The ghost children reveal the Beldum stole their hearts, souls, and lives when she sewed buttons into their eyes and left them there, and they warn Coraline that she'll suffer the same fate if she doesn't escape. She will take your life and all you are and all you carest for, and she will leave you with nothing but mystery and fog. She'll take your joy, and one day you'll awake and your heart and soul will have gone. A husk you'll be, a wisp you'll be, and a thing no more than a dream on waking or a memory of something forgotten. Sounds pretty goddamn terrifying, doesn't it? And to those wondering, why the eyes? Why did she sew buttons into their eyes? Well, as the saying goes, the eyes are the windows to the soul aren't they? Now as scared as she was, there was nothing more Coraline could do at that moment, so she did her best to get comfortable in that tiny broom closet and went to sleep. At the start of the next chapter, the Beldum releases Coraline from her cell, saying she didn't want to do that to her, but the girl was being disrespectful. You might remember that in the movie, it's not the Beldum who lets her out, but instead the other version of Coraline's neighbor Wybie, who actually isn't in the book at all, but was added to the movie to stretch out the plot. While sitting in the kitchen with the Beldum, Coraline remembers something the cat told her earlier that if she wants to save her parents, she should challenge the Beldum to a game where they're the prize. Because in the words of the Beldum herself, Everybody likes 
games. The two agree that if Coraline can find her parents and the souls of the Beldam's past victims, she'll let everyone go. But if not, Coraline has to stay there forever. Coraline wasted no time and began her search right away. With a little help from the Adderstone, she found her first soul in the bottom of the toy box in her other bedroom. She then goes to the other Miss Spink and Forcible's theater, which was now empty and had dog bats hanging from the ceiling, and found the second soul in the old lady's cocoon. This scene actually unfolds pretty similar to the film. Coraline is extremely grossed out, having to reach in the cocoon and take the soul out of the old lady's hands, and as soon as she does, she's attacked by a monstrous version of them, as well as the dog bats, but she manages to make it out okay. After stepping out of Miss Spink and Forcible's, Coraline noticed the Beldum waiting for her outside, looking rather pissed. The Beldum congratulated her on finding two souls so quickly, then suggested she search the apartment in the front of the house. Coraline figured this was a trap, but agreed to it anyway, and the Beldum coughed up the key for her. You want to check out the front side of the apartment, Coraline? Okay. <laughs> there you go. You want it? After exploring the front of the house for a bit, she found a trap door that led down to a tiny crawl space. And in that crawl space, she found a big, fat, amorphous blob that used to be her other father. At first, he tried to help the poor girl, but the Beldum's power was too strong for him to resist, and he was forced to attack Coraline. The only reason she was able to escape was because she ripped out his butt and eyes so he couldn't see, then she quietly snuck up the stairs and closed the trap door. Those familiar with the movie will remember this happening during Coraline's escape back to her world after the cat scratches out the Beldum's eyes and Coraline sneaks her way up the spider web. Also, this interaction with her other father was altered for the movie, so it happened in the Beldum's garden instead of the basement, and it ended with Coraline getting a soul from him instead of it just being a trap. Anyway, after escaping from that night, Nightmare, Coraline went to the other Mr. Bobo's apartment and searched for the third and final soul, and immediately after entering, she saw him through the darkness sitting at the other end of the room. She looked through the Adderstone and saw the final soul glowing from inside Bobo's coat, and despite being terrified to approach him, she did so anyway, all the while ignoring all the false promises Bobo was making about Coraline's wildest dreams coming true if she stayed with the Beldum. Just as she pulled open Bobo's coat, dozens of rats came pouring out, and one of them was carrying the soul. She chased the rat out of the apartment, but she fell down the stairs hard, and when she sat up, she thought she lost it forever. The girl was devastated at first, but when she looked over, she saw the rat's decapitated head sitting several inches away from its body, and the black cat smiling at her smugly with the soul under its paw. She thanked him, put it in her pocket, and now, with the final soul being collected and the false world growing increasingly unstable, Coraline entered the house with the cat. Now this next scene unfolds in a pretty similar fashion as it does in the movie. Coraline enters the house and finds the Beldum waiting for her, looking more monstrous than ever. She shows the witch she found all three souls, then gives her guess for where her parents are. Just like the film, Coraline knows they're in the snow globe, but she guesses the corridor so the Beldum will be distracted while she sneakily takes the snow globe herself. Then, as soon as the Beldum turns back around, Coraline throws her cat friend at the witch's face and runs through the door, snatching the key on the way out. With the help of the ghost, she's able to pull the door shut behind her, trapping the Beldum in the other world. Then she runs through the corridor back home, but this time Gaiman goes into a lot of detail about what the passageway is like. He says as Coraline's hand rubs against it, she feels fur, and it moves as if it's breathing. Then the next time she touches it, it feels hot and wet, as if she put her hand in somebody's mouth. Whatever that corridor was, it was older by far than the other mother. It was deep, slow, and it knew that she was there. Just imagine being in her shoes here, escaping from the monster that threatened to steal your very soul for days on end, only for the final stretch home to be through what seems like the mouth of another ancient paranormal entity. No thanks. Luckily, Coraline and the cat made it back to her world safely, and she was able to apologize for using him as a weapon. Then, as the girl stared out the window, she felt a new appreciation for the world she was once bored by, and fell asleep in the uncomfortable armchair in the drawing room. Chapter 12 opens with Coraline waking up to see her parents, her real parents, standing over her, and she learns they don't even remember being stuck in the snow globe. However, they both seem to be a bit more nurturing than they were prior to Coraline saving them, so methinks the Beldum may have been influencing them with some kind of spell. That night, she ate dinner with her folks, a weird kind of pizza that had green peppers, meatballs, and pineapple chunks on it. What's hilarious about that is Gaiman specifically says Coraline ate all of it except for the pineapple chunks. I guess he wanted to make it clear that she didn't go insane after spending too much time in the other world. Soon after dinner, Coraline went to bed and had a dream where she was visited by the ghost children who told her that her mission was not yet complete. You see, the Beldum swore by her right hand that she would play fairly, 
but she lied. To put it simply, when Coraline shut the door to the other world, she closed it on the beldam's right hand, dismembering it, and the witch was determined to get that key. Coraline then came up with a plan to eradicate the hand for good, and she wasted no time putting it into action. She snuck out to the old well on the edge of her property, using a path that the hand couldn't follow her on, and moved the heavy wooden planks that were covering it. Then she set up what appeared to be a tea party for her dolls, where she covered the well's opening with a paper tablecloth. Next, she went back to her house and told Miss Spink that she was going out to have a tea party, and she said it loud enough that the hand, which had been lingering around the property, could hear it. Then she took a more direct path back to the old well, this time watching the hand follow her in her peripheral vision. After arriving, Coraline needed to lure out the hand, so she put the key to the door in the center of the tablecloth, which was weighed down just enough by the plastic dishes. Then, as Coraline intentionally turned her eyes away from the key, the hand leapt from a nearby tree and grabbed hold of it. This was all part of the plan, though, because the weight and momentum of the hand sent the plastic dishes flying up while the hand itself went tumbling down the well. Coraline finished her mission off by pulling the heavy planks back over the well's opening, trapping the hand down there for good, and that night she fell asleep soundly in her real bed. So that, Solo Cups, was the end of Coraline's original story. But that's not the end of this video. As discussed earlier, I want to go beyond the pages of the book to explore Neil Gaiman's motivation and inspiration for writing it. Because it's obviously pretty f***ed up, and we as the audience deserve to know where those f***ed up ideas came from. Wouldn't you agree? So Gaiman started writing Coraline back in 1990 while living in England with his family. This may come as a bit of a shock, but Gaiman actually wrote this terrifying story for his five-year-old daughter Holly, who was apparently a big fan of scary things. Gaiman didn't write the book all in one go, though. He actually took a six-year break when his family moved to America. And in his words, the reason he picked it back up was, I realized that if I didn't, my youngest daughter, Maddie, would be too old for it by the time I was done. I started it for Holly, I finished it for Maddie. Isn't that just the cutest thing? Now the house Coraline lived in, that was actually modeled off the house they were living in in England when he started the book. And the reason he did this was so that Holly would be able to imagine where everything was. There were of course a few changes here and there, but the most important detail, the door with the bricks behind it, that actually existed in the house that Gaiman himself grew up in. And it was there to separate what used to be the servant quarters where Gaiman lived from the part of the house that was for the family in charge. Another interesting bit is that the main character's name was originally going to be Caroline, but he made a typo writing Coraline instead, and he ended up liking that better. Funny how things work out like that, isn't it? Now when it comes to the Beldum, Gaiman has never specifically commented on what his inspiration for her was, but there is a theory that he was inspired by traditional fairy folklore and a poem written by John Keats in 1819. That poem is called La Belle Dame Sans Merci, which literally translates to The Beautiful Woman Without Mercy. It follows a knight who just so happens to meet a beautiful woman in a meadow and falls deeply in love with her. But one evening, while staying with her, he's visited by the ghosts of past kings and princes who warn him that she's up to something and he's falling for it. The poem then ends on a tragic note, with the knight being discarded by the Belle Dame and trapped in her world, which is revealed to have been a falsehood she created to lure him there. Sounds pretty similar, right? Granted, in the poem, she's after men instead of children, but the rest of it lines up pretty perfectly. From creating a world designed to lure her victims to her, to acting like she cares deeply about her victims in the beginning, and of course being visited by the ghosts of victims past. Just to reiterate, I can't actually find anything where Gaiman cites this poem or any other bit of folklore as inspiration, so it could just be a coincidence, but personally, I think it would be a pretty big coincidence. But now, Solo fam, it's time for me to ask for your thoughts. Do you think that poem has any connection to Coraline, and based off what you heard, what version of Coraline do you like better, the book or the movie? Personally, I'm gonna say the book. I think it carries a far more positive message for children while somehow being even creepier than the film, but I'm curious to hear what you think. Make sure to comment your thoughts down below in addition to liking, subscribing, and sharing this video with your fellow Coraline fans, aka anyone who regularly shops at Hot Topic. Also, make sure you follow me on social media to stay updated on what I'm up to between videos, what content to expect next, or even request a story. I'll be seeing you guys next week when we cover another spoopy topic to end the month of October. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.